as OrthoBrain shines the spotlight on our very own Dr. Ben Hornstein. This is a fascinating uh, look at his career, and he's going to share some of his thoughts, some of which are quite bold. Uh, Dr. Hornstein shares something in common with one of my professional role models. Dr. Bert Seidel practiced for many years in Dayton, Ohio, and he was the ultimate professional. There's such a large divide between a professional and a tradesman. Dr. Hornstein and Dr. Seidel both have vast knowledge across many disciplines. And I think that really distinguishes them as true professionals in so many regards. As you listen to the next hour, you're going to find that he has some strong opinions when it comes to advice for young doctors and also around protection for you, your team, and your patients regarding everything and anything to do with the virus uh, that we're fighting right now. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Dental Ceramics, who generously make trial smiles for all of their dentist clients that use their lab, and they do so at no fee. I'd also like to thank Kettenbach, the makers of our preferred PVS impression material for orthodontics. So thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you enjoy listening and watching the interview as much as I enjoyed making it. Well, I'm just delighted to shine the OrthoBrain spotlight on Dr. Ben Hornstein, an amazing general dentist and a fascinating man. Let's look back and see what he's been up to the past 35 years since he graduated from dental school in 1985. He's currently and has been the CEO at the Center for Advanced Dentistry that's since 1986. The founder of Dental Concepts, a hands-on restorative dental class. Uh, he's participated in photography in an organization called Out of Bounds, and that's been since 2007. He's an amazing photojournalist in sports. I've actually seen some of the, uh, some of the photographs up on, uh, up on his wall, and, and they're, they're quite impressive. Um, he's authored some photography books for dentists and served as an instructor at the Center for Exceptional Practices um, and also uh, participated in some of the education around cosmetic procedures. He's the founder of Eccentricity Coffee Company. Uh, he did that in 2014 and became a certified barista as well as an expert uh, coffee buyer and uh, controller for the company. Um, that's not it. There's more. <laughs> he served as a girls basketball coach. Um, he never played on the girls basketball team, but he did coach them. Uh, he actually received a grant from the Ohio Department of Health back in the mid 90s, and that was to study the incidence and usage of smokeless tobacco in one of the counties in the Cleveland area. Uh, he was hired as a lecturer for Dense Ply Caulk, uh, talking about restorative dental materials and procedures. And he served Kodak Dental Division to help with the development of digital cameras to be purposed in dental offices. Um, along with that, he has a, a number of different hobbies. When I asked him what his hobbies were, he said everything. <laughs> I know what some of them are without having had him mention them. He really happens to be quite knowledgeable and expert when it comes to personal finance, uh, nutrition, and healthful living habits. Um, and most re recently, he's invested abundant energy into learning everything there is to know about the coronavirus. Um, other than that, he's a pretty boring guy. I mean, it's <laughs> like, who packs that all into one lifetime? Um, so Don't yeah, ask my wife, please. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations on, on all that you've accomplished. Um, uh, I am sure you've made a lot of people very proud of you, and, uh, and I know you've contributed a lot to our profession. And and way beyond our profession. Um, what I'd like to start out by asking you is, is what influence you have had from uh, maybe influence and inspiration that you received from the late Dr. Alan Gray? Uh, I know he's your father-in-law uh, of blessed memory. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because I knew him way before you did. In fact, Dr. Alan Gray 
was the man who introduced my family to snow skiing, which is one of my favorite hobbies. And he also introduced me to dentistry. Um, you may not realize this, uh, Ben, but, but your father-in-law took me to hear Ronald Goldstein at the Ohio Dental Association meeting back in 1978. And between your father-in-law and Dr. Ronald Goldstein, I was absolutely sold on becoming a dentist. Um, so I'm curious to hear, because we've never discussed it, you know, what role did he play in your career and, 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 and what comes to mind as, as you bring back some of the memories? Well, Alan was an incredible human being and in many respects was my father, even though my biological father was around, I was in Cleveland and he lived in Cincinnati and then in Florida, my, my dad. And I was with Alan a minimum of eight hours a day every day. It's mm -hmm. amazing we didn't kill each other. Um, so you practiced in the same office? Yes, I, we did. And Alan was a, a think outside the box kind of guy. Uh, he actually, because he thought outside the box, when I named my photography company, uh, it wasn't in honor of him, but because he always made me think out of the box, I was thinking, well, since I'm doing sports photography out of bounds, uh, I'm always out of bounds on a, a in a sports venue. So I, th I thought that was pretty apropos. What Alan taught me was that as dentists, we take things pretty seriously, and but they're just teeth. You know, when you go to a medical doctor, they do the best they can for you, and if a surgery fails, they come out and tell the family, well, you know, I did the best we could, and everyone says, thank you, doctor, for trying. In dentistry, if one of our crowns or fillings or teeth move after orthodontic procedures, people are ready to kill you, sue you, and it's, it's the end of the world. And he just, he kept telling me to try not to take things personally. They're just teeth. And his philosophy was always that he'd rather do a really excellent job for a patient. So he was willing to take more time and charge more for one crown than most people charged. And his philosophy was, I'd rather do one crown perfectly to somebody else's two crowns that are done sloppily. And that, that, that was pretty much his mantra to me. He, when we started practicing, well, actually, sophomore year of dental school, I took the EFTA test with another one of my friends, and you know, uh, Jeff Cantor. Oh, you're brave. <laughs> Jeff and I took the EFTA test and we passed. I don't know how we did, but we did pass. And I started working in Alan's office uh, on... Uh, some days during school days, I should have been in school, but I was working on Saturdays at the time. I don't work on Saturdays anymore, but we were working as EFTAs and uh, he was not using the restorative materials that we normally used in dental school, like amalgam mercury fillings. He was not using, he was using composites. Mm -hmm. And back then we were etching teeth for 60 seconds and desiccating them and they were successful but he taught me how to build crowns from pretty much nothing with composite. And it was just fascinating to watch. So when I got out of school um, and after I finished my residency, I never used amalgam ever again. It was always composite. And I convinced John Levitchka at Dental Ceramics to start doing some procedures after hearing Ron Jackson speak in 1996. Mm -hmm. I came back and said, John, we, we got to start doing this because John and I did a lot of work together. We still do. And he said, no, Ben, I've been burned so many times on different materials. I'm not going there. I said, no, John, this, this is the future. This is what we have to do. Yeah. And it just kind of took off from there. I just got to tell you one other interesting story. So Alan took me in 1980, gosh, I want to say it was like 83 or 84. I hadn't got out of dental school yet to see this video conference. I've never seen a video conference and this was back in the day and it was being held from Germany at Alpha Mega Dental Fraternity Group. Yeah. And there was this guy who was, had this computer, which I had never really seen before. And he was plotting these margins from a camera 
that he took a picture of a tooth and he was plotting these margins and then he he milled this crown i didn't know what milling crowns were but he made this crown from this cnc machine and it was the first iteration of serac mm -hmm. and all the doctors of alan's age actually i'm probably his age now maybe a little bit older than he was when he took me to this meeting but he all the doctors in the room were laughing because the the the, the fit integrity of this crown was not great yeah. uh however i was looking at this technology thinking oh my god this is going to be the future dentistry so i didn't want to say it too loud because i was at a table of like eight dentists so i leaned in my father-in-law and i you know i called him dad i said dad th this is it this is this is going to be the future of dentistry and we kind of looked at each other and winked because everyone else in the room thought it was ridiculous and here we are i have my prime scan i use my serac all day long every day eight times a day and uh it you know he was he was the only one in that room that was really open-minded to what was going on and and he he was just an innovator he was always always pushing the envelope and he taught me to take risks and that's what we do every day that's why they call it the practice of dentistry because we're always practicing new things fascinating story he, he was an amazing guy who inspired a lot of people and uh I had firsthand knowledge of some of the work that he did. I always attributed this. Uh, one of my family members went to your father-in-law for a diastema between eight and nine, and he wasn't the regular dentist. They had a, my, my family member had a dentist for many, many years, a wonderful dentist. I mean, the guy was terrific, but knew that your dad had a reputation, your father-in-law, for, for doing amazing work, and my family didn't come from means, so uh, they were sensitive about fees, but for the, the restoration between eight and nine, they went to your dad. And now that I know that you and Jeff Cantor were there, <laughs> I know why it looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> One of the two of you probably did it. And yeah, just so, just so the audience that are listening, I just want to let them know that your mother catered my wedding. So wow. that was pretty cool. Wow. Well, well, and she, eight and nine looked beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let, I'm going to go back and sw switch the topics at my family, my family dinner table. You can't switch topics without saying switch first. Right. And okay. We'll back to dentistry. Our, our, we live in a culture that is obsessed with sports. And I, as you know, I come from a, a, a family with a sports background. Your dad. Yeah. A lot of our, a, a lot of our viewers are, are way into sports. Can you tell us, um, did you have any opportunity to get to know or interact with any of those amazing athletes that you you photographed yeah actually uh probably um two stories come to mind um i was at a brown i was at a browns bears game ah uh, probably four years ago it's time flies and i just remember when i decided to do this my my wife said to me if you're going to do this if you come home hurt don't even bother coming home your your stuff will be out on the lawn i i, I don't want to have to deal with you getting hurt so uh you on the field is that why you were at risk yeah yeah now so i i mostly shot college basketball some college football and professional football and so i was it was about three below zero my hands were numb and i was leaning in the in the end zone and the bears were driving against the browns and brandon marshall who's about six six he was a wide receiver for the uh chicago bears he made an unbelievable acrobatic catch in between joe hayden and i don't remember who the safety was at the time and he landed in inbounds in the on the back edge of the end zone right where i was kneeling down and i'm firing off these shots looking through my camera he literally and joe hayden was just about to level him when he stopped because he realized he was in the end zone and he 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 his cleat penetrated the the uh edge of my pants and he literally was he was on top of me and my life flashed in front of me and I remember all the teammates came in and they were jumping all over him. And I'm like, 
I'm looking up like this at him, and you know, I'm probably 30 years older than him at the time, and I can't even repeat what the guys were saying on it, to him while they were celebrating. But he looked down at me, and I looked up at him, and I said, I said, brother, thank you for not killing me. <laughs> and he just he gave me this big grin, and I packed up my stuff. I went into the media room where they, they had all these AP guys and Sports Illustrated guys who were downloading pictures. I packed up my stuff and I went home. And I came home, it was the third quarter, and Jennifer looked at me and said, well, is the game over? I said, nope. She said, why are you home? And all I said to her is, I'm done. That's my last game, it's over. So that was, that was, that was a very interesting moment. And then the other interesting moment was uh, I represented the away teams at the Wolstein Center in the Horizon League Basketball League. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Coach Brad Stevens was the coach of Butler. Always loved Butler's team. And, and I've, I was in a couple of his huddles taking pictures. And I get pretty fiery and very emotional um, when I get excited about things. Right. And this game was really intense because Cleveland State was really, was really good at this time. They actually, uh, they, they made it to the NCAA tournament that year. And I've never seen a man with such a gentle, together demeanor. He was so calm. The players just, they were like laser focused. That was the year that they had, um, oh my gosh, uh, Gordon Haywood. Uh, Gordon Haywood plays for the uh, uh, Boston Celtics. And that year against Duke, in the last second of the game, he heaved a half-court shot that banked off the backboard and hit the front rim and came off. And had it gone in, it would have been the greatest upset in, in basketball history. But I was standing in the huddle with all these guys who went, went on to go to the NBA and to listen to Brad Stevens. I learned a lot from him. It helped me learn how to communicate better with my team, actually. Mm -hmm. that, that was a really neat moment. And then the last moment was a story of Tony Gonzalez was a, a tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. And I learned a story about him. He was, he was in a game. He, he had caught a pass on a down and out and got shoved out of bounds. And he pretty much ran over an older uh, AP photographer and knocked him out. And Tony Fernandez refused to go back into the game until he knew this guy was okay. And the guy came around and he sat up and Tony Hernandez asked if he was okay. And he said he was fine. And Tony said to him, please, I want you to go, go to the hospital. I'll pay for it. Just get, get an x-ray, make sure you're okay. And the guy said, I'm not going to go. He said, no, please, I insist that you go. So the ambulance took him and he had a CAT scan uh, because he had a concussion and they found a glioblastoma in his oh, brain. Wow. And the hit on this guy saved his life and he's still alive. And him and Tony got really close. And I just, I thought that was an amazing, an amazing story. So those are a few of the short stories. I could, we could do a whole hour on uh, just that alone. Well, it's a, it's a perfect transition back into dentistry. And that is, that it sounds like it's a lot more safe for you to photograph teeth and patients than it is oh. athletes. Uh, the patients um, yes. probably don't put you at, at such risk. So obviously you really enjoyed the sports um, and the photography around it, kept you involved in it. Tell us, uh, Ben, what is it that you find most rewarding uh, about being a, a dentist? What is it about dentistry that, that really gets you going? And I, I know one of the benefits is, is it allowed you to pursue all these other areas of interest. It gave you the time and it gave you the resources to do it. Tell me what it is about the actual practice of dentistry that you have found most rewarding. Wow, that's a great question. So I often tell my children, um, especially my son, who is always in search of the ultimate job, that work is nothing more than a ends to a means of doing the things that you actually love to do in life. Now, for some people, it is dentistry. I love, I, I love doing dentistry. I, I think 
I can encapsulate the, the answer to this. I just sent out an email blast to my entire patient base, filling them in on what we're doing in our practice now and how we're going to take good care of them. I just thought it was a simple, nice email that we sent out. I got text messages and emails from my patients telling me how touched they were and that some of them called me crying about how nice an email it was and how much it meant to them and it was like wow that that just blew me away so i'd have to answer the question i i i love the relationships i have with my patients mm -hmm. it's not about fixing their teeth i mean that's a technical thing that I enjoy doing. It's, it's the relationships that I have with them. And, you know, in my office, the hardest things for me going back is not being able to hug my patients because every patient that comes in gets a hug. That's just how I am. And I'm not quite sure they get a hug and a cup of coffee, by the way. Uh, but I don't know how I'm going to deal with that because I like, I like the kinesthetic aspect of being close to my patients. So uh, one of the hard things though, is that now that I've gotten older, my patients are getting older and some of my patients are dying and it's just so sad that I, there is, I guess I shouldn't mention names, but one of the oral surgeons that I referred to, his father and I, we, we for 30 years, he was like my third dad and I would call him literally call him two times a week with jokes and just just to say hello and he he had developed cancer and he lived a long time but i always checked on him and whenever he answered his cell phone he knew my number he would just start to i guess the reason i called him is he always laughed at my jokes so the minute he answered the phone i heard that giggle in the back of the phone and um I mean, for five minutes, it just made me feel good. It made my day, gave me energy. And man, when he passed away, I just felt like I lost a family member. And all my, not all of my patients, but most of my peeps, um, I'm tight with them. And, you know, when I come home, I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm on 24, you know, the eight hours there and I have great relationships. We share lots of personal stories. And when I come home, sometimes I feel bad for my wife because I'm spent and I don't have a whole lot more to give. So she's like, you give all day long to your patients. Do you think you can just give a little to me too? And it's, it's tough. Well, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that you're a relationship-based doctor and that it seems that it's the relationships that have been driving you and made you so passionate about what you're doing. That's, I mean, that's what my takeaway is from all this. Um, I'd say that's fair. You mentioned that as you've, as you've made this journey through your career, that your patient population has matured. I'm imagining that your, your, um, your practice has the way that you want to practice has also matured in a sense that as you go through the, the your career, there are different areas that maybe come into focus, this different areas of, of our discipline that become more appealing to you or that you find more meaningful to, to be able to, to offer to your patients. For example, I know that you have expertise in sleep um, in the in sleep disorders, TMD. Uh, I know you're really focused on the holistic aspect and well-being of your patients as well as their aesthetic areas. How, how do you see your practice mix going forward? What do you, what do you see your, your practice offerings uh, looking like um, in, the, uh, in, in this stage of your, of your practice? Another great question. Um, well, I decided, sorry, and I just keep getting being with uh, emails all day long, especially since I've been preparing for this talk coming up. I, I got people asking me stuff all the time. Anyway, uh, I decided long ago when I first started practicing, I, I was in Southgate in Maple Heights and uh, it was pretty much a medical building. And there was a young endodontist who just started practicing uh, I'll just mention his name. It's Mike Stone, who I think the world of. And I used to, you know, I wasn't real busy in the beginning, 
So I used to go down and hang out with him and watch his technique. And it was just amazing how, what a tactician he was. So he tried to teach me as much as he could. And no matter how much I learned or gleaned from him, I could never get the results that he was getting. It, it, it just, his, his work is textbook. It still is. It's even gotten better. So I made a deal with him that I would stop doing endodontics as long as he would see my patients that day, be open-minded to alternative materials because a lot of my patients are very, very sensitive environmentally and chemically to different things. And man, we've had a 35 year relationship uh, where he'll get my patients in that day. So I decided early on, I wasn't gonna do endo. And I decided early on that uh, my father-in-law loved to do surgery. I hated it. So I just let him do all the surgery and he loved it. So uh, as, I've, as I've progressed through my journey in dentistry, I've realized that some of the best cases I've done are the ones I didn't do. Uh, sometimes it's just not worth the headaches and the hassles and the angst that you get yourself involved with. So I've tried to take the focus off of the money aspect and more on what I do really well because I, I take it personally. I don't like to do things that aren't done well. So I've kind of eliminated what I used to do that I did very, you know, that I did decently, but it's got to be perfect. Otherwise, I take it personally and I hate taking that at home. Now, I've just started doing a lot more orthodontic cases with your help. Thank you very much and your team's help and they're awesome. Um, it's a little, I don't want to say disconcerting, it's, it's a little anxiety provoking because I don't know what I don't know yet. And getting in a situation where I'm not sure the path I should go down um, creates tension and I don't like tension anymore. So with your help, you've helped mitigate some of that, which I'm, I'm grateful for. So moving forward, I know that eventually I'm gonna have to bring in a younger dentist and I've mentored a lot of young guys and there's this one guy who's just, he is like me, he's just, he takes no for an answer. He wants to practice with me so bad that I'm gonna probably gonna acquiesce just to get him off my back so he'll stop asking. But I think I'd like to focus more on doing more orthodontics. I love doing, uh, helping people that are in, in pain and getting them out of pain. And sometimes that requires opening up bites either through orthodontics and or doing some sort of reconstructive event. I love doing cosmetics because just, it's just, it's life changing. So I think I like to focus more on that and let the, the younger dentists focus on um, more restorative stuff. Um, so I hope that answered your question. It, it does. Uh, how would, how do you see the synergy between your, your desire to do aesthetic procedures for your, for your patients and orthodontics? How do the two of them um, come into play? Uh, it's a, it's really hand in hand. A lot, of pa a lot of my patients, I should say, they, they don't want to take the time to do the orthodontics. Um, we live in a world of instant gratification now where you, know, you just open up your phone and you have everything at your fingertips, information, contacts, phone calls, emails, texts, and the mindset right now is like, I want it done now. I don't wanna be in the office. I want it done as quickly and painlessly as possible and let's just get it over with. So a lot of the cosmetic cases that I do, I would have to say a majority of the cosmetic cases that we do are non-orthodontic cases that would have been much easier to do had the patient elected to do the orthodontics. Now we offer that for all our patients, first and foremost is moving teeth in better positions to accentuate smile lines and aesthetic zones so that I don't have to be so aggressive in my treatment. So arch form ali uh, alignment is huge. Um, 
it's just, I would have to say 10% of my patients will say yes to the ortho first. And sometimes when we do the ortho, it's good enough for them. They don't want to necessarily do the cosmetics, which is great, which is fine. But I'd have to say the majority of my patients want to do uh, veneers and or crowns. I try to keep it to minimal prep uh, veneers. However, arch form discrepancy is a stumbling block and sometimes you have to aggressively remove tooth structure from the lingual to, to give the appearance that the tooth is moving out buccally, which is a fascinating thing to do if you've never done that. It, it really, it works. So you, you really have to deal with the arch form. Before you even start prepping teeth, you have to get an ideal arch form either with a, a diamond or orthodontics before you really even start prepping teeth, man, if I think about how much I know now to compare to when I did my first veneer case in 1986, wow. um, and I've gotten permission from this guy to, uh, to use his name, but I looked at my schedule one day, and I saw the name Neil Young in my schedule. I went, guys, Neil Young's coming in our practice. This is going to be great. I'll get autographs. Maybe he'll sing for us. Nah, he was just a little guy who came in. But he was my first veneer case. And that, that was after seeing uh, Robert Nixon speak. I don't know if you remember Robert Nixon, but he was a, a veneer guy from California. And they were feldpathic veneers, seven through 10. They were actually minimal preps. And by golly, 30 year or 34 years later, he still has those four veneers on his teeth and they still look amazing, which is, which is incredible. I wish more of my patients did ortho treatment before the veneers, but I get it. And so, you know, I just decided that I couldn't say no to them because they're just going to go somewhere else and, and get the veneers. Uh, sometimes though, if I see I have to get really aggressive, I'm going to sit down and have a real heart to heart talk with the patient. And sometimes I say, no, I'm not going to do it because I know what I have to do. And I'm, going to just, I'm just going to alter the tooth so much that it's going to leave them with few options if there's failure. How do you feel the ability for you to offer the orthodontics in house is going to impact case acceptance for, for pre restorative orthodontics? In other words, with you being able to have the knowledge of exactly what needs to be done in order to minimize enamel reduction and, and such, um, limiting the fees and the time and treatment. How, do you see that having any impact on, on case acceptance for, for orthodontics before getting into the aesthetic dentistry? First of all, another excellent question. You must have asked these questions before, but they're really, they're really thought provoking and really good questions. Um, I can't tell you how many times when I say to my patients, hey, I, I need you to see Dr. Stone because the nerve of this tooth is, is dying or dead and you have an infection. And I get this sad look from my patients like, do I have to go somewhere else? It's like, why can't you do it? Yeah. And uh, it's a hard thing to explain. Uh, I, get, I get the same thing with the orthodontics. And before I started offering orthodontics, I referred a lot of ortho cases out. And it's like, well, are they in the building at least? It's like, oh man. So yeah, it, it does increase the case acceptance when you can do it in-house. Uh, it, it definitely... Perception-wise for the patients, helps them think that you're an expert, which you may think you are, you may not think you are, but actually with OrthoBrain's help, I mean, if you get into a problem, you guys are there to help. And I, I, there is no amount of money in my book that's worth more than that. I mean, it's, it's great. If I have a problem, I'll call D. I, you know, I call you, you don't answer my calls, but I call you, I'll do whatever I need to do to get some help. And it's, it's always there. So I feel very, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm sorry, the number you've reached is not in service at this time, especially if you're Ben Hornstein, I've changed my phone number. <laughs> anyway, um, even if I have a problem now, uh, I know that I can get help. And now that I'm having a few problems recur, uh, 
it's very interesting. I, I will tell you a couple of stories. I, you know, I'm a little lady D, so you ask a question, it makes me think of a million things. I remember in the course that our team took, you talked about uh, early in your orthodontic career and throughout your orthodontic career, you would finish a case and the patient would come in and you would look and all of a sudden you'd look into the buccal corridor and notice that none of the posterior teeth were in occlusion. It's like, what happened? Well, I had a new patient come in uh, a couple months ago and we were doing a thorough exam and they said that they had just had orthodontic treatment and they were having trouble chewing. I said, oh, well, let's take a look. So I looked in their mouth and sure enough, none of their posterior teeth were in occlusion. And I went, aha, I've heard of this. I didn't say that to them. I said, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. So I dismissed the patient and uh, I called you and we had one of those, I. I'm sorry, I haven't used them very much, but whatever that device is that you, the finisher, I think you call it. Oh, eye finisher. Eye finisher, okay. Well, so that's what we're gonna do to try to help close this person's bite. And just funny that you mentioned it, the young, young person who's wanting to join me in practice, that was his ding, he wanted to know if I had any other ideas to practice together. But anyway, um, yeah, so, uh, I, I think that uh, keeping it in-house is huge. Uh, I have much more control. I'm able now to look at an orthodontic case because of my cosmetic background. I know exactly where I want those teeth to be. The question is, can I achieve what I really want orthodontically? So, you know, I'm looking, just the course that I took with you has got me thinking about so many different things, root positions, angulations, now I know that if I try to bring something out too forward or bring it back too much, I'm gonna to lose too much lip support. I'm gonna poke roots through maxillas, mandibles, don't wanna do that. So now I know that, okay, I can achieve maybe 40% arch form that is gonna make it so much easier for me to finish my procedure. So yeah, there, there's a huge correlation between doing ortho in the office. And even though I can't do ortho now, it has helped me from a perspective standpoint to really understand when I do that mock-up in somebody's mouth, is that really gonna work long-term and uh, form and function? How is that gonna play? So it is a marriage. It, 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 cosmetics and ortho, it's just, it, it's, uh, it's invaluable how that works. So. It's opened my eyes. It's actually got me excited again about doing dentistry. Um, you know, we all burn out and, um, you know, I'll just tell you one other story. I, I've been coming home when well, my son got married in, in January, as you know, and I was busy with that. And I was coming home tired and I was looking at my wife saying, saying you know, I just don't know how much more energy I can give to doing dentistry as intensely as I'm doing it every single day because it's just, it's just wearing me down. And now, you know, was March 16th was the last day in the office and boy, I'm pining for those days of complaining of being burnt out because now I'm, we're going into our offices and a study was just released today. Do you know what the number one risk profession for COVID virus is now? Us. Yeah. Us. It's not, it's not the ER doctors, it's not the ICU doctors, it's us and, and otolaryngologists. We are the number one highest at risk groups and I'm your age. I mean, dude, we are, we are on the front lines and we're sac I'm, I'm risking my life every time I go in there. And now I'm risking the life of my family members and my team's doing the same thing. So it's just, it's unparalleled. It's just crazy. You know, you know one of the things is that Research that we have um, we have read mentions that patients trust their dentist as much or more than just about any other professional. So I think that the public really does appreciate the hard work that that general dentists do. As a specialist, I was a firsthand witness to that because patients would come in and they wanted you know they they oftentimes um, 
uh, had some reluctance to, to following our recommendations because they weren't in relationship with us the way they, they are with their trusted dentists. And so I think they realize how hard the work is that you're doing. And um, uh, you almost have to be a contortionist to do some of the work to get in and, and, and see it. So I think they really do appreciate what you do. And um, before we wind down on this, I'm going to transition into, into some discussion about the virus. Um, before we get there, I've got a couple more questions I want to ask you. Sure. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to catch you off guard, but um, you no, you, you, you won't catch you off guard. Um, you've done so many incredibly impressive things in your in your career, and I know you're going to do a lot more because uh, your your mind has not stopped. Uh, your body might be a little bit tired, but your brain is is still going full tilt. I don't know if it's that eccentricity coffee you drink or it's just the healthful life choices you make. Um, share with us what the worst decision in dentistry has been for you. You know, you, so a lot of times we'll, we'll go down a certain path and we're going to try this and we're going to do that. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to have all of our young viewers benefit from your experience that you, surely you've made some mistakes uh, in your career that, that would be wise for them to, to avoid. I know I always tell my kids, hey, there's no reason for you to fall in the same hole that I have. Um, and so you try and, and, and give them advice. I think some, 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 some real, real practical advice and maybe frame it up in an example um, of a mistake that you made that they can avoid. Uh, I could think of several real quick, I'll tell you. Um, I have a learning disability that I didn't know about in co in, throughout my life. I knew that I struggled in the classroom because I didn't learn like people learn in mainstream classrooms. And it, it reared its ugly head in, um, in dentistry. Well, in, in undergrad and, and, and dental school, I had to really relearn how to learn. I didn't know how to do that. So I think my first mistake was not recognizing that and not, getting the help I needed to come up with strategies. And it, and it really wasn't something people focused on back then. Now today you're labeled ADD, HDAD, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that would have been really helpful for me. Uh, I think that's the first thing. The second mistake I made was doing a general practice residency. Uh, it, it, was, it was just a waste of year. I mean, I learned some medical stuff. I did some really cool things, but my father-in-law, he taught me in three months more than I learned in dental school and my GPR. That, that was, that was a, a, a big mistake. The other mistake I could say is if, if I, and when I talk to young dentists all the time or people who want to go into dentistry, I encourage them to take business courses, uh, accounting courses, marketing courses, uh, economic courses, anything that you can learn in, in business is, is huge because what you realize after a short period of time is that you are, you are running a business and it's easy to do uh, technical aspects of dentistry, but if you're not a shrewd business person, then you're going to struggle. And I learned early on that I needed to educate myself about business. And uh, that, was, that was a real epiphany for me. And that it's, I, I work on that every single day, just learning more about economics and, and business. And I think the uh, other thing, it wasn't a, wasn't a mistake. Um, I guess one of the mistakes is I should have moved into my current location sooner than I did. I was afraid to leave the community I was in to move into a new community, but it was the greatest thing I ever did. So that was it. And then the, the, the last thing, it wasn't a mistake. It was probably the greatest thing I ever did. I was hesitant at first. It, it's a bit controversial because some dentists will think that this organization is ridiculous. In many respects, the, the guy who runs it is pretty pompous, but I overlooked that because I, I try to take away from 
every person, whether I agree or disagree with them, I always can learn something from them. But I did a four year intensive study at the Las Vegas Institute in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I studied with some of my father-in-law, father-in-law's contemporaries like Bernie Jankelson, who wow. taught me about neuromuscular dentistry and growth and development, very much like Dr. Enloe was. I, I didn't understand what Dr. Enloe was trying to teach us in dental school. And then I heard Bernie Jankelson talk. And he was a bit older than me. My father-in-law's uh, contemporary, I believe, was Barney Jankelson. And that was his father. That guy taught me so much about occlusion and so much about growth and development and airway uh, um, issues. The light bulb just clicked on for me. And I, that was in 1999. I came back. I was so excited. It changed the way I practiced. I learned how to do full mouth reconstructions from start to finish that finally made sense. I mean, I prepped with my instructor out at the at LVI with, I don't know where there's like 16 other dentists. I prepped 28 teeth in an hour and a half, maybe less, and maintained the bite, temporized, and I was done in literally three hours. I was done. I'll, I'll never do it that way again, but it proved to me that anything's possible. So if I'm gonna give any other advice, take as many hands-on courses as you can take, never stop learning. Techniques are always changing. So I guess that would be the, the long answer to the question I asked. I think that's- or You cool. asked. Yeah, I think it's one of the critical messages. I wrote them down. I'm gonna repeat them and make sure that I got them right for our viewers. Um, I heard the power of a great mentor, which for you was your, your father-in-law, that, that that superseded even what you were able to learn in a formalized um, residency program. Um, without you saying it, I'm hearing the power of community. I mean, you were, you were, you were trusting and open enough with our, with, our, with our viewers to share something incredibly personal about your life. And it just seems that, that uh, when you were having those challenges, the power of community and finding people that can support you and help you solve some of your, your challenges um, probably holds true at every point in your career right up to this day. Um, and that's, that's essentially what we're doing right here and what you're about to do with your, with your, um, uh, your words of wisdom regarding uh, the virus, getting, getting schooled up to, some, to a basic level in business so that you're able to understand what's going on with your practice and in your personal business life, because you've got both of those and they're so intertwined. And then the value of, of, of really picking out the great educators and finding a great way to get education and this idea of education by, by doing, you know, that there's only so much you can learn in a classroom. If you can put your hands on it and really learn it, you're going to, you're taking you're going to learn a whole lot more. And that's, that's basically how I, I would summarize what you said. And I think those are, I mean, they're brilliant points. I don't, I, nothing even comes to mind that is more important than what you said. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to take um, a little bit of time, maybe uh, about five minutes for you to tell us a little bit about what you've learned and, and, and to help our audience understand. Um, I, I think you already get this about Dr. Hornstein. When he's interested in something, he will dive as deep as you can possibly go and really understand things top to bottom. When he did it with photography, when you look at his, his uh, I call it um, uh, his, his photojournalism in sports, you won't find better pictures. I mean, they're sports illustrated quality pictures. When you get into the coffee, I've sampled some of the coffee. There is no better coffee. When it came <laughs> to learning Thank photography you. with teeth. I've seen some of the imagery, it's, it's right there. So when I know that as you've, if you've gone deep in, in your study of the virus, you have a lot more information um, than, than most will have. Uh, there are a lot of resources, a lot of places that you can get it. Um, what I'd like for you to do is tell us maybe some take home points, um, why it's important for us to learn more about it, um, what you feel the, um, uh, the, the, the biggest points are to know as, as we get ready to, to reemerge into practice and to keep in mind as we go forward. And the topics that you're going to cover in your webinar, you're going to have a live webinar. So I'd like for you to tell us when it is and, and 
um, and, and make sure that people have the ability to find it. Um, we'll, we'll share that information with our listeners as able, um, but, but tell us a little bit about some of those points in, in, in the next five minutes or so. Sure. Um, diving deep into something's both a blessing and a curse, by the way. Right. Uh, this is a very difficult situation and there's conflicting news reports there's conflicting information that comes out i've been able to glean my information from people on the front lines Uh, a lot of my friends are in charge of emergency rooms and in icus all over the country i speak with them pretty much daily just to keep updated to what's going on there's something called r not r not is the virulence of a of a particular disease so for example if you were to be in a circle of 10 people and someone sneezes how many of those people will become infected with whatever illness that you have so for instance the r not of influenza a is one meaning that if you're in a circle of 10 people, one person's going to get sick. The R naught for the SARS CoV 2 is five. Five people will get sick if somebody sneezes. That indicates the virulence of this virus is really high, meaning that it creates disease very easily. The that, that is very disconcerting because it means that a lot of people are going to get infected. And just because we're going back to work and just because the numbers have been kept low does not mean that this is not a serious issue. It's a very serious issue. And if you get sick, granted that a lot of people will not, will recuperate, the people that don't, um, they die horrific deaths. It's not, it's not a fun disease to get. And you do not want to be labeled as an office that had a cluster breakout because, as you know, it just takes one person to ruin your practice. It takes 100 people to talk good about your practice. But if you're labeled the office where all those people got sick, nobody's going to walk into your office. I don't know about you, but I don't want it, my team to get sick. And I don't want their family to get sick, and I don't want to bring this home to my family. So you have to take this very, very serious. We're going to have to change the way that we practice. You have to assume that every patient coming into your practice is, it has tested positive because it's the 24 hours before you start exhibiting a fever where you are shedding the most viruses and you are shedding millions and millions of these viruses, and you're going to have no idea that the person that's shedding the virus is actually sick. So that's why you have to treat everyone like they have the virus. So I am, I'm actually converting two of my operatories. We have five operatories. I'm actually converting them into portable operating rooms. I'm putting up six mil uh, visqueen, see-through visqueen around the entire rooms. I'm putting in two air filtration systems and we're gonna operate those those operatories that are creating aerosol as if they're operatories and we're going to we're going to use operating room techniques for donning on uh, on our uh, ppp ppes and we're going to take them off just like you would in surgery and we're you know we're probably end up going to get a washer and dryer system so that we don't have to use disposable ones. We'll just, we're just gonna wash um, our, our drapes and we're gonna double glove and we're gonna take this really serious because I, my friends that are on the front lines, they, they tell me stories and they're, they're telling me what they're doing and that's what we're gonna do. I mean, I just learned today how they take off their N95 mask using Tupperware. I mean, it's really cool, the, the innovations that they're using. I, I have no N95 masks, and they're not coming in, according to the dental supply companies, until June. So we got to do whatever it takes to keep ourselves safe and 
more importantly, to make sure our patients know that they're going to be safe because they're not going to want to come into a situation where, where they're not going to be taken care of. So um, five minutes it really isn't enough time to really get through it, but I think those are probably the most in, important things uh, to talk about. Uh, there, the, truly, if you have a chance, Tuesday at two o'clock, and I don't have the Zoom link memorized, but I'll, I'll get it to you. You can give it to the people who are interested, but you should definitely tune in. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. It'll probably be an hour, and I'm going to stay on and to answer every question that I can possibly answer. Uh, we're going to talk about the etiology of the disease, how it started, what it is, what is this virus that everyone keeps causing? Why is it causing the reactions in us that it's causing, and what is it causing? What type of reactions? Some some treatments, potential treatments, potential vaccines. Talk talk about. Uh, testing and then i'm just going to get into everything that we're going to be doing in our office and we've been working every day our team's been working materials that were coming up innovations just some normal things that you can use we're we've we're going to use ozone machines in our office to kill bacteria and viruses we're going to use ozone machines to disinfect our masks we're going to be using uv lights to disinfect our masks i mean we've We've, I've turned over every stone possible and every day I learn something new. So I don't know, maybe uh, we can create through OrthoBrain uh, an up, I can send you updates that you can email to your doctors that you're working with. Just like maybe anytime I learn something new, I'll shoot you a quick email with some more information. You can, you can, you can um, shoot that out to everyone and so they'll be up to date with anything. Um, I, one last thing, uh, there's one disinfectant that we'll talk about on Tuesday that, uh, that uh, Rella Christensen was talking about a week ago. And I got in touch with the manufacturer today and I got in touch with their distributor today and I told them that we have a huge need for, the, for this and they've been getting hundreds of calls now that the word is out about this. Um, uh, new material and I'm going to use it as a, uh, a teaser so that people listen to the course. But uh, people, people are trying to work with us and I've been calling 3M and different manufacturers just trying to get through to them that we need PPEs. We don't have enough to, to get started. So uh, exciting things are happening. Uh, it's going to be a while and I, I guarantee you that this is not going away. You know, the, the talk was, I think it's called the uh, going back to work in quote unquote, the post Corona outbreak. And it was a play on words because there is no post. It's here to stay. Well, it, it um, one, thank you for the Herculean effort that you've made uh, on our, you know, on the behalf of our profession to really, truly understand it at, at the deepest level possible. Um, it brings back everything, at, at, I think at our age, everything seems to trigger some sort of memory. And I remember back in, um, in the mid eighties, uh, you and I practiced without gloves, right? Oh, God, yes. right? We, had, we practiced without gloves. We practiced, orthodontists did not have any sterilization in their offices in the mid eighties. Um, we didn't have the most basic infection control. The instruments stayed on the, on the table. They never went away. There were alcohol wipes. And right. when the um, AIDS epidemic broke out, Ohio was one of the first, if not the first state to really implement some, some strict infection control guidelines. And I remember practitioners saying, I can't do an endo procedure with gloves. Right. I'm retiring. I will never practice with gloves because you cannot do an endo with gloves. Right. And I remember the pushback and it was, it was really deep. And I, I, don't, I don't see that. I don't know whether or not that's going to come, whether it does or it doesn't. Um, it's a horrific um, catastrophe or disastrophe, as I've called it. And on the other end of it, there are going to be a lot of things in dentistry that are a whole lot better than they were before the virus. And the same thing with healthcare. It's an incredible accelerator for us to be innovative, to come up with better ways to keep uh, our patients safe, our team safe, us safe from all the things that we can't see. Right. And, uh, 
And the way that we're able to provide access to care, there's, there's just, there's so much innovation that's taking place as a result of this horrific thing. I invite everybody to join Dr. Hornstein on Tuesday. Uh, anytime you have an opportunity to listen to him, you will be fascinated, you will be impressed. And uh, I hope, uh, Ben, that you, you know how grateful we are for you making time to share your thoughts us over this past hour. Thank you. I'm and grateful for the, for the opportunity to share with you. I'm grateful to you for your friendship and your guidance and uh, anything I can do to help. If anyone has any questions as, that are listening, just contact uh, OrthoBrain and they can get to me and I'll get back to you with whatever I can do to help. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all the viewers for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.